haven't given him much time to get set. Are you set? I'm ready. Praise God. Without further ado, Brother Craig Treadwell. Come on up, Brother right. Treadwell. <laughs> Amen. Praise the name of the Lord, everybody. You may be seated. It's good to be in temple with you all again. And uh, you can just stay seated. We're going to start with Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13. And uh, appreciate uh, Pastor and Sister Wolf. Honor them in their absence. And uh, Brother Samuels and all of you, looking forward to a good service as well. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then Joshua 14, 11. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in the day how that the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me. Then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for an inheritance. And with the Lord's help, I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're reading here for just a little bit in this uh, teaching session along the lines of fighting for your territory, combating for your terrain, which may not sound good, but I think a lot of Christians have forgotten what they have, and I think that's one of the reasons why Joshua and Caleb were so determined, and I love how he said, give me this mountain, but let's remember, keep all this in perspective, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. So when I say these things, I'm referring to the spiritual battle that we're in, and I think all of you understand that. But is it possible to possess terrain and may, you may not realize it? Can you imagine if you had a wealthy side of your family and you didn't know about it and they passed away and you were in their will but you had no connection to the family and I think there's a lot of people good people that don't know about this salvation they don't understand that there is the possibility for an eternal inheritance in heaven waiting but obviously it comes with a price and and Jesus paid the price on the cross Jesus paid the price for our salvation we all know that and for us who have stepped into our birthright we get that but there's a lot of people that have not yet come to that realization and we know that no man can come unless the Spirit of God draw him there has to be a drawing by God's Spirit, but there also has to be a response from us. And, I mean, can you imagine some amazing piece of property and you are the one designated to receive that, but you didn't know about it? And that may seem crazy, that may not seem in the realm of possibility, but whoever this person is, maybe a, a wealthy relative, or they don't even have to be wealthy. They just wanted you to be the one to receive. I know that sounds crazy because most people would inform the one that they want to receive their inheritance. 
but <clears throat> I'm just making a point or even if you knew about it and you had never been on location and so you just were not informed of what was supposed to be yours. I think about the scripture in Luke 8 and 35 and I think about how that, you know, the world has painted a picture of Jesus that's not accurate. The world has, the religious world has painted a picture of Jesus that is so not biblical, like Jesus was this, just this docile person who never confronted evil. And that's not the Jesus that we read about in Scripture. And so I, I think what I'm trying to get across in this first teaching session is that for those of us who are walking with God, it's not just been handed to us easily. Even if you were raised in this way, even if you grew up in this, there still has to be a determination within your spirit that you're not going to let go of what God has given you. And to me, this also speaks loudly and clearly and it takes my mind to Jacob and Esau how Esau was the one designated for the birthright but yet he did for whatever reason Esau didn't appreciate what was coming his way or he just wasn't totally tuned in in his mind and in his spirit with what he was giving up and I don't know if he didn't care about it or if he just, I think if he understood what it meant, he would have cared. And I think that's a problem with a lot of people is they don't understand what they're really giving up when, whether they walk away from this truth or they just don't understand. I remember when I was just a child, before I was born again, my cousin had been witnessing to me, telling me I needed the Holy Ghost and that how good God was and all of this. And I was, I was like in third grade, so I was in elementary school. And I had another friend. <laughs> so get this, I tried to go talk to him about God, but I didn't even know God yet. <laughs> it's hard to talk to someone about God when you don't know God yourself. But I was just, I said something to him such as, uh, don't you want to go to heaven? <laughs> and he said, heaven? Oh, man, that's going to, that, that would be boring. And I've, I've never forgotten his response. And I think his response, honestly, even though we were children, that perhaps a lot of people, whether they may not necessarily see heaven as a place that would be boring, they either don't really believe that it exists or they don't fully realize what it's going to be. And the truth is, none of us do. In fact, this is in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Eye hasn't seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. And so, you're not going to safeguard your terrain if you don't, understand number one what it is and even though eye has not seen ear has not heard in our times with God in his presence in our spirit and in our faith we know God has a place prepared for us Jesus spoke of this so if we don't occupy what Jesus has given us then fallen Lucifer will take it from us what you don't appreciate is what winds up going by the wayside, if I'm making any sense. But often the resistance taking place in our lives is actually a wake-up call that we need to appreciate what God has given us. And so we don't always realize, I think, because Satan is so subtle, 
that he's trying to steal that which God has given to us. And every child of God, no matter who you are, goes through difficult times, trials, tribulations, times of loss, times of despair. I've seen people get stronger during difficult times. I've seen people quit on God during difficult times. So difficult times are often a test of our faith. And this is why when we go through difficult times, we need to draw closer to God, not allow it to drive a wedge. And the Lord knows how to use our brothers and sisters to comfort. And that's why it's so important when we go through difficult times and we come through on the other side as a shining star to realize someone else is going to go through a tough time and God may use you as an instrument of love and compassion to help that person through it as well. And, and even the Apostle Paul spoke about this, that he could comfort other people during their difficulties in areas where he had been through those difficulties as well. But sometimes when we go through tough times, we don't guard our minds, we don't guard our emotions, and we can actually forfeit the terrain that God has given us back to hell. And that's not a good thing, obviously. So we can't afford to just roll over and play dead. I've seen people who just didn't fully understand what God had blessed them with and they just kind of let it go by the wayside because our carnal minds trick us into believing that circumstances just happen, but nothing just happens. And I know this is tough and I don't claim to have perfected it, but every difficulty is an opportunity to learn something. <laughs> and I know we usually don't see it that way. We just want to fix it, get through it, and get back on the highway. <laughs> but everything has an origin and a purpose. It didn't just happen. It was targeted. A lot of things, and, and I know people will sometimes say, oh, well, you're spiritualizing everything. I know there's not a... I'm not one of these people that believes there's a devil under every bush and, you know, um, a tornado of demonic spirits in every situation. But I think a lot of times we forget that spiritual warfare is a real thing. There's a real heaven. There's a real hell. There's real holy angels and there are real fallen angels called demons. And let's be honest, the enemy is looking for opportunities to try to discourage us and trip us up. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief cometh not or the thief does not come but to steal, kill, and destroy. The good news is, is Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. <laughs> so regardless of what the secular world says, whether it's doctors, and I'm not against doctors. I think God can use them as long as they're not telling people to do things that would counteract the Word of God. Or professionals, and I'm not against professionals, same thing. But you are in a different realm because you're a child of God. And that puts you as a child of Jesus Christ in a completely different category from the rest of the world. We are not better than anybody else, obviously, but we are his children. And so similar to the way you look at your children, God looks at us. Now, as a parent, hopefully you have expectations of your children. Of course, every parent does and should, as long as those expectations aren't unreasonable. But it's children that don't have any expectations from their parents that just wind up becoming spoiled brats. And everything's handed to them. So, God has expectations of us as his children. And the Bible speaks to this. The Bible tells us if we, as his children, are without correction from God, we're bastards. But if we're his children, 
God will at times chastise us and correct us. And his word does that. And I know in a crazy world where globalism is taking over, um, this started a long time ago. That, but look what it's look where it's gotten us. And when when they, you know, tried to get rid of the Bible in our public schools and uh, really tried to discourage parents from any sort of discipline. And I know abuse is a real thing, but they tried to confuse it and muddy the waters. And uh, trying to say a little swat on the sitting down place is child abuse. <laughs> and, you know, I understand there's balance and there, there is uh, a time for everything under the sun. My point is the enemy is really good at creating confusion. And that's why more than ever before we've got to be rooted in the word of God. But we allow ourselves, at, even as God's people, to accept certain things as normal, like we've seen the last two and a half years. The biggest brainwashing scheme in human history, and yes, COVID was real, but the rest of it is, is a bunch of hogwash. And I have seen people, even in Texas, totally brainwashed now. And they just bought into the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker. And I go to states that are totally socialist controlled, and it's, 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 it's like a zombie society. And I think to myself, we've got to snap out of it. And there's only one way. Combating for your terrain, defending the territory. And I don't, I don't mean with missiles and physical weapons. Because again, I quote the same scripture, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Um, the battleground is in the mind, and the soul is in the mind, the spirit is in the mind. Everything's in the mind, and yet it may infiltrate throughout our whole body. Um, you could cut off my arm, though, and I could still live. You cut off my, my head, I'm dead. Cut off my head, I'm dead. That rhymes. <laughs> you, you, you can't live life as, as a zombie that doesn't have any direction, especially in this day, because when you let go of the principles that God has given you and you just say, well, whatever. I heard a, a preacher preach one time. It was Paul Mooney. He said, there is no such thing as whatever. And of course, he preached it like 20 years ago when everybody was saying whatever to everything. You remember that? I still hear it, and there's been times I've been guilty of it. Where do you want to go? Whatever. Where do you want to eat? Whatever. Where should we go to church? Wherever. How should we raise our kids? Whatever. Do you want to go to heaven? Whatever. Is there anything real and true in this world? Whatever. <laughs> so that was his message. There's no such thing as whatever. There's really not, and, and it's, it, it, it really resonated with me because that's our culture. Whatever, 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 but God says no. Make up your mind who you are, what you believe, and you'll never understand who you are if you don't first know what you believe. And this is why we're in such a mess in our world, and not just, you know, in the elite echelon of those who rule the world, but this affects our daily lives and our families. And, and that's one of the reasons why our world is in such a mess, because people just have bought into whatever. But what I'm proposing as God's people is we need to understand who we are, what God has given us, not for pride, not for arrogance, but so that when the storm comes in, that our foundation is secure and we won't be destroyed. Because if you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. And I, it's, you say, well, that's building faith. No, it's reality. Yeah, we've got to have strong faith to withstand what's coming. And I'm looking forward to the rapture as much as anybody. <laughs> and even though I'm not talking about prophecy this morning necessarily per se, uh, yeah, the rapture's coming. But there's a storm coming before the rapture. Many storms. So this is more important than ever that we have the ability to combat 
the enemy when he comes in. And the good news is the Lord is with us. The Bible tells us that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against the enemy. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we have so many promises from God. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The battle doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. But that doesn't mean that we're jellyfish or we have no spine. There are times you've got to stand up for yourself in terms of what you know, who you are, and what you believe. So, if you're tired of living in a constant state of defeat, and I'm not saying you are, I think as the shoe fits, wear it. But it's time, because there's all time, even, even as solid children of God, there are times that we face unexpected situations and it can shake our faith. So, this is in the Bible, Ephesians 6. You know, God has given us the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, but Ephesians 6 gives us the whole armor of God. And it's when we take on the whole armor of God that it gives us the confidence to fight the enemy in the way that we should. And I think about Hebrews, how they didn't appreciate Moses. Well, Hebrews talks about this. I mean, the, the actual situations in Exodus. But they didn't appreciate Moses. And they wound up, and, and Moses had his faults. Moses made his mistakes. Some of it was Moses' fault. <laughs> but they, they added insult to injury by blaming Moses. The whole thing wasn't Moses' fault. He made his mistakes. But in a similar way, Hebrews is comparing the situation with Moses to what was happening with Jesus and how when Jesus faced his darkest hour, all the disciples fled. <laughs> when Jesus needed his disciples the most, or wait a minute, is it the reverse? We needed him the most. <laughs> it was actually the disciples that needed Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was going to be fine because he was God Almighty. But I'm just saying the Bible says they all fled away. None of them were anywhere to be found. And he did feel forsaken, but he knew that was just his humanity. We all feel forsaken at times in our lives. And uh, even after you've won a victory, you may go through a time of emptiness and wondering what was it all for. Elijah felt that way. <clears throat> so what am I trying to say? We didn't come this far to just let Satan take from us what doesn't belong to him. It doesn't belong to him, and he can't have what God has given to us. We can't control what the enemy does to this world. We really can't. We're the light of this world. We're trying to evangelize this world. Yes, we can make a positive difference as God's ambassadors, but what the Bible says this world is destined for not that God likes it. No, God hates it. But God already told us what is going to happen in this world. The good news is that while we have chaos in the world, the Bible tells us that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Think about Jesus and his disciples. They're out on a storm, or on a ship, excuse me, during a storm. And I love how the Bible says Jesus commanded the waves to be calm and still. <laughs> Don't you wish you had that kind of authority and power? Well, you do, because Acts 1 and 8 says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And it may not always be God's will for you to calm a physical storm, but you can speak to your spiritual storm. You can speak to your emotional storm. And you actually, as a child of God, have the authority to command the enemy to get off your back. And in the name of Jesus, he has to obey the God that, the, the, that's in you, the power that God has given you. You have power. And I know that we're not gods. We don't want to be gods. We're not demagogues, demigods, whatever. We are not little 
miniature gods. But at the same time, I think a lot of Christians don't understand the power that they have. <laughs> now, of course, I'm talking about spirit-filled Christians <laughs> who have the genuine infilling of the Spirit of God. <laughs> you know, for a, and I, I listen, I rejoice that if for anyone that professes faith in Jesus Christ, that's a wonderful thing. But we know that's only the beginning. Why sell yourself short? But Jesus purposely went certain places where he knew it was going to be a battle. Jesus was not afraid to face the enemy head on. And neither should we be. Why? Because we know the battle belongs to the Lord. What did, what did God instruct the children of Israel to do? Many times, his strategy wasn't always the same. But in one particular instance in Chronicles, the Lord sent out praisers and musicians ahead of the army. And you know what? The enemy might have looked at this and thought it was the strangest thing they'd ever seen. They may have even mocked them. But God inhabits the praise of his people. What that did, that brought the presence of God on the scene. I can tell you, as just someone who's read the Bible, I mean, we've all, everyone here has read the Bible through many times, right? We've all read the Bible through from Genesis to Revelation many times. I'm sure all of us have. And, and it astounds me how if it wasn't for a miracle from God, Israel would have been crushed. Most of the time, <laughs> they would have been crushed. Now, they trained. The children of Israel were not wimps. They, they were warriors in so many aspects, with the sword, with strategy. But think about how many times the children of Israel were way outnumbered by thousands. And yet God gave them victory. And if it wasn't for God, they would have lost most of those battles. <laughs> You see, that's why all glory and praise always belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. There are, there are multiple reasons why God gives us victory. Number one, so we can move forward and grow in God and, and, and be more ready for heaven, you know, as, as time marches in that direction. <clears throat> but there's also the reason so that you build your repertoire of victory. You say, why? So that the next battle that comes into your life, you'll be able to draw faith. The Bible says the memory of the just is blessed. <laughs> so you can draw faith that, hey, I, I know I can defeat this devil because God gave me victory over that one. Now, when you fought that one, last year or five years ago, you thought that was the biggest devil that ever existed, ever. But now you're looking at one twice as big, with twice as sharp claws and teeth, and you think, oh man, I thought that one was bad. This one's really bad. But you have faith that if God gave me victory over that hound dog, I can beat this pit bull. Nothing against pit bulls. Maybe you have a pit bull. Maybe it's the nicest pit bull on earth. But it's still a pit bull. As soon as Jesus steps off the boat, this deranged, disgusting, animalistic looking thing suddenly approaches him. And this insane creature of a man actually fell down at Jesus' feet. Wow. Wow. And most people would have run the other way, screaming, howling, whimpering at the sight of this guy. I wouldn't have tried to take him on. But So what must have Jesus' disciples? See, Jesus wasn't just about going out into the pastures and picking flowers and saying, let's go be nice, sweet people. And, and, and Jesus teaches us to be kind. 
absolutely and loving and to be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good let's remember something as I talk about this people are not our problem say that with me people are not our problem but that is stuck in our head when we face problems we're always looking for someone to blame we all do it because we always think it's not my fault it's someone else's fault <laughs> which is probably the first mistake we make in looking at a problem and often you are the innocent one and often it is someone else's fault I know But we're just slow to look at ourselves because that's the hard part. It's easy to blame someone else. It's hard to go into self-examination and say, Lord, what could I do to be better? Maybe, maybe I can't control, not maybe, I can't control what other people do, but I can control how I react or not react at all. It's easy to be reactionary, especially when someone cuts you off on the highway. I know I use that example a lot. It's, it is. If someone cuts you off, it's easy to get right up on their bumper and put on your brights and say, what you doing, man? You just cut me off, bro. You know that? That's easy to do that. But is that the Christian response? Let them go, man. Let them get the ticket. If they want a ticket, they can have it. If they want to go 110 in a 75, you can have it, man. I'm done with tickets. <laughs> yeah. But this crazy man is doing the right thing it's easy to blast this guy because he's a psycho. But God saw just a glimmer of hope in him. Where everybody else saw someone that should be in the psych ward, he's a total mental case. I don't believe that Jesus would have approached this guy if he didn't see a glimmer of hope that he could be delivered. Aren't you glad the Lord looked beyond our faults, as that old gospel song says, and he saw my need. <laughs> you see, man, this was a case. Medication wasn't going to help the guy. That probably would have made him worse. All the counseling in the world, and I'm not against good Christian counseling. There's a place for it. But this guy needed deliverance, spiritual deliverance. And even though this, you know, there's, <clears throat> I don't need movies when I got the Bible. And the best movies are the ones that the Bible is the script because this situation, when you really read the Bible at face value, this is some really powerful stuff. I mean, this is some earth-shaking stuff. There's twists in the Bible. In the sense that this man who was demon-possessed actually started worshiping God. But there was something desperately wrong with his worship. Have you ever been around someone worshiping? And we're not people's judge. Let him that's without sin cast the first stone. But have you ever been in a service anywhere and, and someone was worshiping, but there was just something not right? And you weren't going to go say nothing. You were just, wasn't your place, none of your business. But there's just something not right. And you just, it, it just, it distracted you. It just, and look, I'm all for people being exuberant, running, jumping, shouting. Praise God. But I've been around some, it seemed like they wanted attention. And uh, this guy, though, it, it was more than that. Maybe he was crying out. Maybe he was in this, in this bondage, and, and there, was, there was just a glimmer of hope within him. It was like there was this little child inside of him, but he couldn't get out of the prison of demonic oppression that he was in. But as he worships Jesus, a unique conversation unfolds, which was on a different level from what the disciples could see. For example, Jesus, Son of God, and at that particular time, most of his disciples didn't even know who they were with. You realize that? Not all the disciples in the very beginning when Jesus called them understood that he was Messiah. Now, some got it in the beginning, but some did not. And it took them a while to see his signs, wonders, and miracles. You know, and I know a, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but it doesn't say that we should be against signs and wonder, wonders and miracles. If that were the case, God wouldn't have given us 
the Corinthians gifts of the Spirit. We're supposed to be totally in favor. It's just motive has to be right, desire has to be right, and reasons. So these signs shall follow them that believe. What, Mark 16? So signs, wonders, and miracles are absolutely, totally the divine will of God. We just don't build our lives uh, and make all of our decisions on whether or not we observe, you know, Saturn and the moon coming, you know, uh, closer to Earth before I make a decision. That sounds strange, but I'm saying some people make decisions only based on, you know, their furniture floating around their house or something. And those aren't signs and wonders and miracles anyway. That's just weird. And I'm not into the paranormal, so I'm not getting into that. You believe what you want. But I'm not saying stuff doesn't ever happen, but that's just not my uh, speciality. But see, here's the thing about the disciples. They spent three and a half years observing God in the flesh do what no man could do. What was impossible with man was possible with God. But they were not present when Jesus was born, so they didn't understand the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, thus the virgin birth. Now, yes, later they got it. Later they got it. And it might have taken some of us a while to get it. But it's hard for us to relate to this wild man in Scripture because even though he's worshiping, he's extremely strange. And... Uh, you know, I know some people give Christianity a bad name, but we should never get away from understanding that there's no limits to the power of God. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just can't put your finger on something. But see, here's something else you want to keep in mind. And that is, just because someone else may be out of whack or out of balance, you ever have a wheel that's out of balance? It's hard. It affects the whole car. <laughs> Just because someone else may be out of whack doesn't mean that we should allow that to slow us down. You say, give me an example. Okay, I was not alive in the 1940s, okay? But my pastor was. And my pastor related how during the 1940s there was a huge resurgence of signs, wonders, and miracles in Pentecostal apostolic circles. So much to the point that he told me he actually observed uh, tumors falling off people's faces. That, and he said it was real. It was verifiable. This was before the ability to Photoshop videos and all of this. He was there in the room when he saw limbs straightened and people have genuine miracles that were observable. He said, but there was, there's, a, there's a flip side to every coin. And he said there was also... A rising, uh, there was the real, there was a lot of real, but he said there was also a lot of fraud that, that rose up at the same time. So you had the real, genuine move of God with miracle signs and wonders, and then he said you had a lot of fraud stuff where people get up on a stage and they just blow on a bunch of people and they are supposed to fall over and you're healed. Fine. And, and so what happened is he said a lot of people that... And rightly so, we're so determined, we're only going to be associated with the genuine, real thing. He said, what happened, and I also heard one of my instructors in Bible college talk about this, Brother Dan Seagraves. He said, this term began to emerge called the latter rain movement. And he said, what happened is, those spirit-filled believers who were associated with the real thing, we're so determined not to have anything to do with the fake as we should not be. But he said what happened is a lot of people backed off from the real thing in an abundance of caution out of fear to not be associated with the fake. And I believe that's a trick of the enemy. Yes, there's always fake. Yes, Jesus warned us against the fake. And yes, we should guard ourselves against the fake and not have anything to do with it. I believe the way to counter the fake is to put more coals on the fire for the real and not quench the spirit where the real fire is burning. <laughs> because here's the thing. What's the old cliche? Cream rises to the top, right? <laughs> you ever drank raw milk? 
I've milked a couple cows 40 years ago. And uh, it's true. Absolutely. But, you know, we, everything we have now is homogenized, so we don't see the cream. It's all mixed in. But when you see raw milk and you see that the next day, all that cream's on the top and it's like two inches thick, well, don't worry. See, we got we to gotta free ourselves from the fear that we're going to slide off into some fake thing. You know how to protect yourself from that, right? Don't ever veer from the true, genuine Word of God. And you'll be safe. And relationship with Jesus, obviously. <laughs> I mean, that's number one priority above all else. But our relationship with Jesus Christ is solidified in the principles of his word. So the two go together, word and spirit. Someone said, if all you have is word, you'll dry up. If all you have is spirit, you'll blow up. So you got to put the two together and have the balance of word and spirit. <laughs> and Jesus is the word. So we have nothing to fear. Jesus is the Word. So you and I never waste our time engulfing ourselves in the Word of God, not just in church, and we've got to have preaching. The Bible says we're saved by the preaching of the Word. But alone, by ourselves, every day, getting into God's Word. And, uh, you know, I'm glad my grandmother was Pentecostal, and she gave me a lot of guidance and help. But even my wonderful, praying grandmother said, Craig, don't just take my word for it. Read your Bible and make sure what I'm telling you is actually scriptural. She said, because, you know, I mean, the point she was making was obvious. So Jesus, think about Jesus. Wow, I'm almost out of time. Everything Jesus did was motivated by compassion. Everything. Everything. Can we say that? I can't say that. I want to be that way. I'm trying to be better in that way, but just when I think I've arrived, I fail. <laughs> We're all fallible. But Jesus, but you know, hey, Jesus sees as long as we are trying to be like him. And that's the thing. But the enemy is so sly. He said, oh no, don't try to be like Jesus. That's arrogant. No. We're not trying to be God. We, we want to take on his nature. That's godly. Yeah. And uh, everything Jesus did was about delivering people. He did what nobody thought could be done because he was God Almighty. So Jesus did something that most people would consider very dangerous. He proceeded to negotiate. Now, most of the time, Jesus just said... Go, you're out of here. Demons out. And he, he didn't pray. He commanded them to leave. <laughs> now, there's a time to pray, but then there's a time to command the enemy to get off your back. <laughs> and uh, But in this case, Jesus, he wasn't showing subservience. He wasn't giving them kindness. But what he was doing was helping this guy get totally free. But what's very interesting and unique about this situation is that these there wasn't just one spirit that had this guy. There was a multiplicity. In fact, this is what the demons requested of Jesus. They said, don't make us leave this terrain. And that's one of the reasons why I titled my message, Combating Your Terrain, because I know that sounds anti-Christian. It's really not. Because I'm talking about a spiritual battle, not a physical one. But <clears throat> this legion that we're talking about here, they actually said, they knew Jesus was going to make them leave. And Jesus, Jesus, what could Jesus do? Jesus could totally crush them all in a second. And by the way, uh, this is Luke chapter 8 and verse 35, I've, uh, where, where Jesus delivered this guy. And I, I forgot to give you my reference for that. Luke 8.35, I think. <clears throat> and so this, what the Bible says, have this guy so bound in spiritual darkness and chains was called legion. And here's what they said. They said, don't, what they were saying in essence, these are not their exact words, but this was the point of what they were asking 
Jesus. They knew Jesus was going to make them leave this guy. They had total control of his mind, his emotions, everything he said. And they were basically saying, don't make us leave our terrain. Now, Jesus could have hit them with lightning. And I know sometimes we wonder, why do demons even exist? Well, you'll have to ask Jesus that when we get to heaven. <laughs> there was a rebellion in heaven. But what did Jesus do? He cast legion out of the man into a herd of swine, and the swine ran down the steep hillside into the water and drowned. They simply wanted terrain. You see, Satan has absolutely no value for human life. We've seen that in the abortion uh, movement. The herdsmen are jolted because they have never seen anything like this before. And, of course, they go into town. They tell everyone what had just happened. And people all around came to see Jesus. And Jesus didn't even necessarily want a crowd, but he wanted to help people get their deliverance because his supernatural power is like a magnet, but the results are not always pretty because his light shines into the dark places. So think about this as I wrap this session up. While we hate the demons, while we hate the evil that's in the world, and I think our world would function a lot better if we would just realize the influence that the enemy has. But the good news is, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. But had it not been for this crazy, wild, psycho man in need of deliverance, no one knew what to do with this guy. They just let him out there. And only Jesus could have solved it. Then there wouldn't, had it not been for Jesus doing what he did, then there would not have been a miracle then there wouldn't have been any revival and there wouldn't have been a spreading of the knowledge that Jesus was working the way he was working. So what am I going to leave with you in the next 30 seconds? If you are under attack and if you're not under attack now, you will be, sorry to say, but you're under attack for a very specific reason. And here's the good news. You're going to come out of it wiser, stronger, and better than before the enemy attacked you. We don't get strong when things are easy. And trust me, I'm human. I like life to be comfortable and smooth sailing as well. <laughs> but I am not where I am today because it was handed to me on a silver platter and because it just came to me easy. No, I had to fight for what I have. And again, I don't mean physically, but spiritually, I had to fight in prayer and worship, not with an ugly spirit, but with submission to God saying, Lord, I give you this battle. I can't fight this on my own. The battle belongs to the Lord. And when you do that, your victory isn't just a possibility. Your victory is a guaranteed as long as you continue to trust in Him. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus, for your word that gives us solid, clear direction and anchors us in the promise that no matter what we face in this world, you have already defeated the enemy that tries to discourage us, that tries to pull us down, that tries to throw us off track. We have learned, Lord, to continually give it to you. We give you praise and we thank you for what you're going to do in the main service. Now strengthen your people and give guidance and comfort and peace to anyone that may be going through a storm and let them know, give them the peace that passes all understanding that you are with them all the way to victory. And someone said, hallelujah. God bless you. We'll see you back in here in 10 or so minutes.